Howdy, let's chat about the quaint little animation studio, Blue Sky Studios. While usually Disney and DreamWorks dominate the animated landscape, Blue Sky's vibrant animation and smart franchising has helped keep it a unique, stylized movie maker. Loving my life in the jungle, everything's wild and free. But now that Blue Sky has been, uh, acquired by Disney and become another tiny segment of the monolithic mass that Disney owns. I wanted to look over Blue Sky's 13 films to name the treasures and more unsightly pavement squelches. So let's check out the top three best and worst Blue Sky movies. This includes every movie they've made from 2002 to 2019. So let's dive right in. For the third worst, Ice Age 5, Collision Course. While I liked the first Ice Age, this is definitely a franchise that is not afraid to shy away from sequels. Take Ice Age 5. By the fifth installment, things certainly seem to be barreling downhill. The original Ice Age started off as a fairly heartfelt personal tale of three unlikely friends. Manny the Mammoth, Sid the Sloth, and Diego the Sabertooth Tiger. They trek across the blistering snow to save Roshan, a human child. We then get the Getting a Girlfriend sequel, the Adding Offspring sequel, and the Pirate Ship sequel? Ha! Captain Gut, here to help! And by this film, the stories devolve to the point of alien spaceships, doomsday meteoroids, immortal prehistoric animals, and Simon Pegg playing a super daredevil space weasel. And despite all this, the movie still feels so unremarkably boring. The main plot is downright insane. Scrat, the prehistoric squirrel and Blue Sky's minion of the franchise, tries to get his acorn and boards an alien spaceship, as you do. From there he causes the meteors to hurtle towards the Earth, Everybody jump! soon to annihilate everything on the planet. But more important than that, apparently, Sid loses his girlfriend and focuses on finding a new mate. Diego and his wife want to have kids but wonder why kids are afraid of them. And Manny is upset his daughter has grown up and found a man, blah 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 blah. To me, it feels more like a dull sitcom episode of Fuller House than it does a legitimately interesting animated story. But the movie then turns into a race against time to pull off a crazy plan by Buck, an intelligent but somewhat insane weasel from Dawn of the Dinosaur. He aims to find a way to push the meteor away before it annihilates the planet, while being hunted by flying dinosaurs. All of these other side plots just jumble together into this befuddling mishmash while barely connecting with a meteorite disaster at all. Buck the Weasel does most of the action hero stuff, but I'd rather be watching the characters I've known for four movies doing something to contribute. In fact, the main trio seem more like an afterthought to a Buck the Weasel TV show pilot. <laughs> I was glad to see the original Ice Age made a dent in animation history, despite not being tied to Disney or DreamWorks. But to see it devolve like this from a thoughtful personal tale to just boring over-aggrandized slapstick left me disappointed. And for the third best, Rio. Finally, a freaking parrot animated movie. After all these years of Disney and Pixar and DreamWorks giving us rats, mice, and ogres, we actually get a movie about one of the most beautiful animals on the planet, the parrot. Wow, this is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. <laughs> See what you've been missing? Yeah. I remember first watching Rio a long time ago, and frankly, it was just what I wanted to see at the time. If I were to sum up Rio in one phrase, it would probably be predictable, but pretty. Like, I just adore the colors on this one. It's this vibrantly sun-drenched palette that just adds to the spectacle of the set pieces. And as I've mentioned before, I just love the tropical setting wherever it's used. Though I will say, the plot at its core is pretty straightforward and generic. And there are some of those hyperactive, overly energetic scenes that we can expect from some of Blue Sky's animated films. Right. Yeah, it's all about swagger, like some kind of crazy love hawk. Ah! The story is the old tried and true buddy road trip with a side of romance, as two rare macaws, Blue and Jewel, try and free themselves after being chained together. Blue's a very timid, sheltered peck macaw, struggling to fly. Blue, oh, just wait. Who's dragging whose butt now, huh? Ha ha, very funny. While Jewel's a wild macaw who's loving her freedom and would never step into a cage. 
Some critics credited Rio for how beautiful it is to look at, particularly the Rio island itself. And the casting was spot on too. While both Blue and Jewel really drew me into their characters, Anne Hathaway as Jewel was probably my favourite. She's assertive, but also clearly having a great time exploring the world. And throughout the movie, both Blue and Jewel's excitement is infectious in a good way. Ah, ah, am I dead? No! We're still alive! <laughs> <laughs> Even if the setup feels pretty cliche, I did find these two together interesting and believable. How would these two highly contrasting personalities clash? On a side note, parrots are also among my favourite animals, so that helps. I wonder why there aren't more animated movies about parrots anyway. I'd much rather watch tropical parrots over the endless trove of rats and mice we normally get. The music is also superb, really adding to the spectacle of all the set pieces here. I think the best quote I've heard to define the soundtrack is slinky and sambalicious. That Brazilian atmosphere really breaks through, and I found the cultural novelty refreshing. You could describe Rio's characters as predictable, but I still found myself swept up in the excitement all the way through. The story certainly doesn't have the depth of, say, Toy Story or Up, but it's not trying to tell a deep story. Even if I knew the roller coaster track, the ride was fun enough that I might even ride it again. And the second worst Blue Sky film is... Epic. From the title alone, you can probably tell that Epic has a lot of story behind the scenes. Initially, Epic was going to be named after the tiny warriors in the movie The Leaf Man, and be a more simple story about their lives. But after many rewrites and rebranding, we ended up with Epic, a story that can be summarised as beautiful flash with no particular substance. The narrative has this weird Fern Gully vibe, as a girl who is trying to reconnect with her crackpot dad gets shrunken down by the Queen of the Forest, and is thrust into a war between the Leaf Man and her... uh... Boggins as they fight to see where the new ruler of the forest will be born. It's the old story of the girl learning the terrible plight of the Leafmen to help them and herself grow as people. It's Avatar, it's Fern Gully. It's honestly a structure I've never seen be interesting in a movie, ever. At least it's not quite as corny and overblown as movies like Fern Gully or Cameron's Avatar. But there also aren't any characters that stood out to me. Though I'm sure she's trying her best, Mary Catherine unfortunately comes off as a pretty dull protagonist. Though I don't think she had much good writing to work with. There's a multitude of different characters that start cramming for space to be in the spotlight. Though the cast mostly felt pretty bland to me. But Colin Farrell as the action warrior Ronan and Christopher Waltz as the eccentric villain Mandrake both had some pretty epic moments. What a surprise! I get so few guests! Could be the stench of death. Some people don't care for it. Though unfortunately, they're pretty lost in the shuffle amongst the cliches. The visual direction's interesting, but there's no real good story to carry it. Leaving this feeling not so epic. Well, now I'm just embarrassed. <laughs> and I think the second best Blue Sky film is... Robots. Robots was pretty well met by critics for its unique and distinctive animation. It really stood out among the movies that year, but was constantly critiqued for its unusual, off-the-assembly-line story. I think we're definitely seeing a problematic trend here among Blue Sky movies. Unfortunately, since Ice Age came out just before Robots, it mostly stood in the shadow of its predecessor. But rewatching it now, this 2005 art style has aged surprisingly gracefully. I mean, check out the cartoony and unique visual style of Robot City here. Even its people stand out in their fun, inventive movement, variety, and comedy timing. But the story does feel pretty typical. Basically, the wide-eyed dreamer goes out to the big city to have his dreams stomped on by the greedy villain. But still, it's a story told very solidly. You go to Robot City, you go meet Big Weld, and you show him your big ideas. Our wide-eyed dreamer for this film is the unfortunately named Rodney Copperbottom a hopeful inventor who wants to go out to the big city so he can earn enough parts to help his breaking down dad. But in Robot City, Rodney finds that the company he dreamed to join was taken over by the shrewd and rather enjoyably wimpy Phineas Ratchet, who along with his mum, Madame Gasket, plans to scrap all the robots who can't afford their shiny new upgrades. Therefore, I've come up with a new slogan. Why be you when you can be new? Yeah, the commentary isn't so subtle. And while the allegory of the rich getting everything while the poor are disposable is very on the nose, I more just enjoy the wholesome nature of Rodney, just doing everything he can to make his ill dad proud. Every one of their scenes just shows this real heartwarming familial care to it. I'm really sorry I let you down. No, 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 no. You 
could never let me down, Rodney. It's helped by a brilliant all-star voice cast too, including Robin Williams, Ewan McGregor, Harley Berry, Amanda Bynes, and Mel Brooks. It's a fusion of jazz and funk. It's called junk. Everyone brings a lot of joyful color and personality to their performances. The villains especially have wonderful camaraderie of a poisonous yet loving relationship between mother and son, and an oddly supportive father figure. Oh, bye, Bob. So long, son. Good luck with your dastardly plans. While there are a few instances of cheap pop culture and potty humor thrown about, overall, Robots is going to be a pleasant film that is definitely worth a watch. And before we get to number one, let's go through some quick honorable mentions. Horton Hears a Who. For a lot of people, this is a Dr. Seuss movie that's always overlooked, which is a shame because it's my favorite of all of them even if it doesn't have the mass audience appeal of a 2018 Grinch movie. But it's also way less obnoxious than the 2012 Lorax film. And it's certainly not the cringe-filled, nightmare-inducing <laughs> the, the cat in the hat was. In fact, its animation brings to life a fluent and expressive style to Dr. Seuss's imaginative creations. Sure, it's got your occasional pop culture gag, but that was all the norm in the 2000s thanks to DreamWorks. Oh, Lord. <laughs> I think Horton Hears a Who gets forgotten easily, but it's my personal favorite Dr. Seuss animated movie. Ferdinand, the tale of a delicate peacemaker bullfighting back against the cultural tradition of bullfighting. This could be an engaging concept for a movie, especially to introduce this concept to children who may have never heard of bullfighting. However, while John Cena does give a heartwarming performance to Ferdinand, the movie itself seems confused about how it wants to present this no-fighting theme to us. The movie just beats this peacemonger drum again and again with Ferdinand, yet it ends with an oddly meh answer on whether it actually wants bullfighting happening or not, which I'm okay with personally, but it does make for a pretty empty viewing experience. Spies in Disguise as of this video, this is Blue Sky's most recent movie, and it may be very well its most unique out of the entire library. It really shows me Blue Sky's headed in a very creative direction. While spy movies are a dime a dozen in the live action film market, animated films rarely do spy thrillers like this. Will Smith's as cool and charismatic as ever, and a story that hits its emotional and comedic notes with a shocking level of grace and care. Spies in Disguise is solid evidence that Blue Sky is upping its game. Ice Age. This is the very start of Blue Sky's legacy. It's a nice enough animation style, though animation from 2002 does age pretty quickly. But you can't really blame that on Ice Age. I mean, to me, most movies in the early 2000s looked really, really ugly. Even some of Toy Story 1's animation aged pretty badly. I think the story and characters are where the movie really shine. The camaraderie between Manny, Sid, and Diego as they try to return the child they rescued is delightful. It feels a lot like three friends going on a road trip together. And I liked at this point, Ice Age still had its share of quiet moments. I recommend focusing less on the sequels that include a primate pirate and a squirrel piloting a UFO, because the original Ice Age is still a movie with a good balance of goofiness and heart. Anyway, on to number one. And the number one worst Blue Sky film is... Rio 2. Blue meets his greatest adversary yet. His... father-in-law. Oh. What a disappointing sequel. This wouldn't have stung so much if I didn't enjoy the original Rio and remember it fondly. But this is where I think the franchise essentially keeled over in the gutter and passed out. It's just a horrendous mess. While the original Rio's animation and music helped excuse its fairly predictable story and romance, this is definitely a case of sequelitis. It takes a mutual romance that I actually enjoyed and makes it into a sadly one-sided romance, even a bit toxic. But I'll get to that shortly. Plot-wise, Blue and Jewel, after getting together in the first movie, have three kids. Boy one, hip one, and smart one. That is until Blue's owner and her squawking boyfriend <coughs> find more wild blue macaws in the Amazonian rainforest. So while the humans are traversing the forest and handling the environmental plot, Jewel convinces Blue to come and find their flock. While a true blue Minnesotian domesticated bird like Blue is hesitant, he gets the advice to always make his wife happy. If this is important to Jewel, just do it. Happy wife, happy life. Remember that. So he does everything he can to bring her and her kids to find the flock. And then we get the meet the parents story with birds. 
Blue has to prove himself to Jules' dad and Jules' old attractive male friends so he can be the bird that they all expect him to be. Yeah. Morning. Already Rio 2 sounds like Blue Sky made a movie by smashing together every sequel cliche into a single film. And that's before even mentioning the bird soccer game, the jungle American Idol, the villain revenge, the evil loggers, the kids embarrassed by their dad, the list goes on. It's just a hodgepodge of plots that barely intertwine, leaving the movie sliding at a snail's pace. And sadly, Blue the lead spends a majority of the time being seen as pathetic, despite him being central to this movie. I just feel bad for Blue. He spends the majority of time sacrificing all his comforts of home and safety, all the peace of mind he had for the majority of his life, all for his family, and his wife is constantly condescending to him despite this. Can't you just forget Linda and Tulio for one minute? Stop thinking about just yourself and start thinking about us. This bugs me because in the original Rio, Blue and Jewel looked out for each other mutually. What I liked about their relationship was they both had something to learn from the other. They supported each other's strengths and weaknesses. That's part of what made it nice, if a predictable relationship. The movie essentially states that Blue should give up everything he originally was and migrate to the forest. There's even a scene where Jewel's father flat out calls Blue a pet and not suitable for his daughter. I should never expect any more from a human's pet. That is, until the humans start cutting down the rainforest, and the movie instantly bends over backwards to say no, Blue. Your individuality can save everyone, making for this weird muddled moral of only be yourself if it benefits everyone else. If it doesn't, you're an awful, self-centered person. Okay? Much like Emperor's New Groove, this is another case where I found the villains far more interesting to watch than the heroes. Nigel the melodramatic cockatoo is his usual self, and Gabby the poison dart frog really stands out as the most interesting character to me. She gives a really memorable voice performance. I know that you can hold me. Feel me close now. Unfortunately, Rio 2 just ended up being a muddled mess of a story and really hurt many of the things I liked about the original movie. And I think the number one best Blue Sky film is... The Peanuts Movie. Wake up, Big Brother! I think for a lot of people this is a favorite, and I totally get that. For an American audience, Peanuts by Charles Schultz is a staple of any newspaper. On the level of Calvin and Hobbes, like Garfield, even if it's not always funny, it was always nice to see this slice of life from the Peanuts kids. The only real negative I had for this movie is it can be a bit slow paced, but that's not inherently bad. In fact, the slow pace is kind of refreshing because the film gives exactly what the comic delivers, a slice of life in the world of Peanuts. So the slower pace gives us a bit more immersion into the lives of the Peanuts, specifically the day-to-day -day life of the ever-relatable screw-up, Charlie Brown. I got my kite! The story simply focuses on Charlie Brown dealing with feelings of inadequacy and how people see him. He deals with social anxiety and we see how people treat him does affect his personality. The main story is he wants to prove to himself that he's not just a mere blockhead. However, he's often thrown obstacles that seem impossible to overcome. After a new girl moves into the neighborhood, he develops his first crush and the rest is him just trying to better himself for her. It's simple, but cute. <laughs> She said hello! <laughs> Thus we get to see Charlie's attempts and failures to impress everyone, especially the little red-haired girl. While the film is a bit of a checklist of Peanuts gags, such as the football gag and the wall talk, there is so much heart and characterization to this film. The wholesomeness kind of builds on top of itself and becomes a real delight to watch. The characterizations for most of the cast is very solid, especially Charlie's relationship with Snoopy. And Snoopy also has a nice subplot that connects to Charlie's story with a red-haired girl. And the key to tie it all together is the animation. In order to adapt something like Peanuts, you need to capture the feel, but also the look Schultz brought to his comics. I think Blue Sky succeeds in always getting that unique feel right. Here, it's so perfectly captured, much like the Captain Underpants movie. The characters look like they're right off the two dimensions of paper and have stepped into the three-dimensional world. So from visuals to writing, the Peanuts captures and exemplifies everything I've enjoyed about Peanuts since I was a kid. And to me, that makes it the absolute best Blue Sky movie. Personally, I still prefer Blue Sky over Illumination. I mean, even if their writing is sometimes lacking, Blue Sky's made a name for itself in its inventive and trend-setting artistic visuals. When I see a Blue Sky movie, I know it's Blue Sky, 
I find myself looking forward to Blue Sky films more than Illumination. Because of that unique visual flair amongst the clumsy stories, it gives us movies like Rio, and I find that very memorable, even if it's sometimes predictable. And I'm looking forward to seeing where Blue Sky goes with their next film, Nimona. And I wish all of their 500 hardworking team members the best of luck with Disney. And if you have any Blue Sky films that you particularly like or dislike, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.